I just can't get enough of Sector 318C. Welcome back, everybody, to another match on the Brightworks, where today we're going to be taking a look at a match that was played, as you may have already guessed, on one of my favorite maps of currently all time. Yeah, Sector 318C. It's one of those really cool maps that's imbalanced in a certain way to make sure that the aggression stays high throughout the entirety of the game. It's got a lot of cool features on it. It's got these cool plants and stuff. I'm really a really big fan. Spawning over here on the eastern side and representing the blue team as the Cortex Commander, none other Whoops, wrong key. Then Scarecrow, 100. <laughs> Already off to a good start here as I, uh, whoa, dive into, I guess, the most recent ping right there. Fumbling my hotkeys. Been playing a lot of other RTS games. Been playing some Command and Conquer recently. Completely messes me up for beyond all reason because I try and use those hotkeys here and I try and use the bar hotkeys there. It's been throwing me off a whole bunch. Scarecrow, going to be playing in the air start here and so indeed going into one of those Cortex Air Labs. Very good to see. Expecting a lot of good shuriken play here as well as a couple of fighters, maybe even some bombers. Looks like we've got a scout as well as a transport queued up right here. What if we're going to be going for something cheeky here? The transport itself might have just been handed off to a teammate, but the scout plus transport indicates to me that maybe Scarecrow wants to get out on the map with the commander. Maybe try and claim some metal extractor spots. Maybe try and help push the front lines with some of his teammates. I guess we're just going to have to wait and see. The red commander representing the red team is an armada commander in for or uh reformed sorry snowflakes informed snowflakes sounds like some sort of reporter or something reformed snowflakes going to be playing as the red commander here 26 true skill silver tail of chevrons to speak of as well gonna be putting down that radar tower and i love to see it radar definitely one of those uh well neglected parts of this game it's probably the most important part of this game and uh, one of those things that I certainly tend to forget a lot on the front line, but it really does help out quite a lot. It buys you so much time as far as early warning systems go. It definitely helps prevent your base from being scrambled by all these ticks and rovers and rascals that are already headed across the map here for the blue team. Really lovely stuff. Kalev going to be trying to sneak some of these... What are these? Ticks fast? Yeah. Okay. Good micro here. One of them sneaks through, or at least sneaks past the uh, initial grunt over here. The grunt does spy it, but a little bit low on APM, so it will be... Ignoring the tick here, but luckily for Spojav, the commander will be moving into position to intercept here. That tick will go down. This one over here will also likely be targeted. Uh, yep, there it goes. Blasted apart here. Very nice deflection from the red team. Excellent to see. Already we've got a whole retaliatory strike headed on over as well. Five ticks in total. One tick could be a nuisance. Two ticks can definitely be a threat. Five ticks... You've got yourself a solid problem here. And indeed, that problem is headed directly towards the Purple Command Center. We have a uh, pawn running forward to intercept. <laughs> Five ticks actually beats a pawn. You just have to surround it and you'll get that flanking bonus. Uh, not the best micro right there in those ticks though. And so the pawn will eventually clean all that up. Not a problem though, because there are already a couple of orange rovers in the back lines as well here. Here come those shurikens that I was expecting to clean some of this up, or at the very least alleviate some of the pressure by time for some of those units to clean a lot of this up. Transport was indeed handed over here, at the very least not in use by the blue commander anymore. Instead, gonna go ahead and, uh, oh yeah, looks like transport's handed over to Stuck Fart, who, uh, yeah, decided to, uh, transport forward here. Love that name. Our lines are being set up. So, what I was talking about earlier, as far as imbalance maps, while we have a second here, while the front lines seem to be relatively stable, I love the aggression from both teams, but while we take a second here... I want to talk about the reason why uh, imbalanced maps make it so much better to watch. And I think part of that is because it means that essentially this northern side is always going to have a tech advantage over the uh, left hand side here. I should say the right hand side of the northern side is going to have a tech advantage over the left hand side of the northern side. Obviously mirrored for the southern side as well here for the red team. But I'll just uh, indicate here that you can see indeed we have Achilles MSG who is going to be going for a tech lab here and essentially no reason not to because you're in the backline position you're protected from your teammates you can go for other plays certainly you might go for a cheeky airplay maybe go for some cortex shurikens and try and get some really huge value on the front lines just push your front lines really aggressively but most typically i would say the standard is to almost always go for a little bit of uh, a little bit of a tech advantage in that position not what we're going for here from barneck barzy Definitely a much more aggressive strategy here. Instead, using that economy to just flood grunts across the map right here. Going to be positioning them right behind the red commander. I hope these get handed over here. If we hand these grunts over, I think this is an excellent play. This is actually going to lend quite a lot to the red commander, who has had to march quite far forward here. We have aggression versus investment. Going to be going head-to-head -head right here. So I guess we'll have to see who wins. Red team investing heavily in, in uh, or I should say the blue team investing heavily in tech. The red team putting all their metal into troops on the front lines. 
Now the thing about troops on the front lines is oftentimes you can use them to kill your enemies. I know, I know, it's a crazy idea, but if you kill your enemies, then you get all their metal as well as the metal from your own wreckages, and that's usually a tremendous benefit. Adam62085, trying to push forward right now. Do a little bit of damage. Uh, twin light laser tower is gonna blast that commander pretty harshly though. Commanders actually are weak to light lasers. There's not very many cases in this game where units are specifically weak to other turrets or other structures or really anything. Uh, but commanders being one exemption to that. These LLTs can definitely do quite a lot of work to these LLTs. Uh, sorry, to the commanders on the front here. You can see, by the way, the experience of that uh, LLT is way, way higher because it's shot at the commander, which is one of the more valuable units in the game. So it uh, adds quite a lot of experience quite quickly here. Beamer turret's obviously going to be quite powerful as well. Glad to see that. We do have a bomber coming out as well. Whirlwind headed across the map right now for Scarecrow 100. Going to be trying to go for some killer bombing runs. Uh, looks like it's going straight towards Reformed Snowflakes base. Yeah, that's a lot of wind turbines and they're all real close together. Beautiful bombing run. Takes out so many of those wind turbines. Want to say about maybe eight or so wind turbines in just a single bombing run and that bomber's not done yet. Anti-air hasn't been built right here. Fighter is eventually pulled, but all the wind turbines go down for Reform Snowflakes. Man, that's a bummer. Here we go. The storm has approached. Shuriken up in the air, gonna be blasting down these medium tanks, or, well, paralyzing down these medium tanks, I should say. There is a fighter up in the air trying to shoot these down, but one fighter does not a defense make against the overwhelming power of the Shuriken here, trying desperately to paralyze anything they can on the fronts. Uh, definitely not enough Shuriken to paralyze the commander, but it's not gonna matter. Paralyzation meet obliteration. And now that commander lies in ruin right here. A beautiful pull right there, some excellent teamwork, meaning this front line is even a more dire situation right here for the blue team. This is the side that is expected to crumble for the blue team. So they're gonna need a whole lot more effort now to hold this line now that thousands and thousands of metal are now lying on the floor over here. Resbots need to march forward and reclaim that metal, put it back into the red economy ASAP. Reform Snowflake's in a bit of trouble right here because of course that, that economy going down, uh, the wind turbines I do mean, it suddenly means that, uh, yeah, the Red Commander actually can't spend all the metal that he's now inherited on this front line. Maybe the right idea here would be to hand it back to the eco player in the back, hand all that metal to Barnek Barzi, who does actually have the economy to support all that. We're gonna have to wait and see what the Red Commander decides to do. T2 is up and running here. We have one T2 metal extractor and we're working on a second one here. Just a single con turret, so we are improving that slightly here. Eventually we'll get those T2 maxes up and running. And as soon as those are up and running, you can really start pumping out those T2 units and mass here. 500 energy per second, usually about good enough to start T2 production. A little bit better, of course, always, or a little bit more rather, always a little bit better, of course. Units on the front line, namely here, the Wolverines, gonna be firing those high arcing projectiles up into the air and down onto the enemy forces. Always good to include a couple of those just because they're one of those units that can counter essentially every one of the T1 early defenses. Save for the gauntlets and agitators, the Wolverines are essentially a one solution fits all. Grunts are pulled, these are just Rocketeers. Very, very shy against the uh, oncoming assault forces here. Uh, commander in position to degen down some of these as well as those shurikens eventually end up cleaning all this up, but the Rocketeers did fall at the very least. That allevi alleviates a lot of the pressure right here that the yellow commander was up against. Meanwhile, Ryan Tank trying to escape but not going to. Yeah, Centurion's pretty sturdy. One of those few bots that can actually sustain a, uh, well, any kind of presence against the Pounder. Those, those riot tanks are extremely menacing. They fire an, uh, a projectile, and really the main thing about that projectile is it has a huge amount of impulse, which means that it knocks units around all over the place, and especially lightweight units like bots, uh, but also blitzes and incisors like the incisors here, which have completely ravaged the frontline forces of Spoja. Beautiful play. Although it does leave the Lavender Commander a little bit exposed up north, yeah. A lot of tanks pushing forward here, but those tanks are, are pulled off the front lines of another line here. It does mean that the Orange Commander now has a great opportunity to push forward. We do have slowly but surely more and more Shell Shockers and Whistlers and all sorts of other Siege units pushing forward. This LLT forest might stall long enough here for Stuckfart to be able to recuperate and rebuild from the losses that we incurred on this front line. Oh, but the Centurions didn't manage to get the Commander kill here. I think if we were a little more aggressive, these Centurions probably could have killed this Commander. Killing that Commander could have equalized things on the southern side because we lost the Green Commander, could have taken the Yellow Commander and maybe stabilized, but at this point, the Red Team is definitely up in metal as far as I can tell. Shell Shockers, medium tanks, even a Janus included in this composition down here, but we do have the counter to them, the Rocket Bot. The Humble Rocket Bot. It is one of those units that's very easy to mass up and then they just become effective. You don't have to worry about building a very complicated composition. A couple of res bots make this a little bit better, but overall you just keep the Rocket Bots marching and you're gonna be in a pretty good spot. What you don't wanna have them do is sitting still and being barraged by the 
fire from those shell shockers. That's definitely one way to get them blasted to smithereens extra quick. Obviously, the shell shocker's main strength being its high damage, but its primary weakness being that it fires a big overarching projectile that takes forever to actually connect with its target. And so as long as you're moving around, it's really not likely that that's going to come down on your army. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so much damage from those T1 artillery pieces. That Janus, every time that Janus fires away at that commander, it strips off about 15% of the HP. Very, very dangerous. Yeah, we're tiptoeing around right here. Melty tool knows that if this army goes down, it's going to be a nightmare to deal with. Lightning turret on the front to try and thwart some of the forces here. Love to see it. Abiyuyula. Abiyuyula. There we go. <laughs> Purple commander on the northern side. Has a bunch of maces, and the maces are great, but they're just not sturdy enough to go up against those bots. They're basically your best choice, but even your best choice is not I, not not 100% perfect. It's not efficient. It's a uh, it's a losing battle, to say the very least. A couple of medium tanks snuck up north here. They did face resounding Janus fire. Those twin missile launchers, definitely quite powerful. Be it connecting with a commander or a bunch of medium tanks, they're more than happy to blast all that to absolute scrap. Indeed, a commander goes down over here. Stuck for it, managing to get the kill on the orange commander here. Doesn't take out the army with it, though, and that is important. The army stays alive, and that means... Ooh, a lot of friendly fire there from those Janices. With the army staying alive, it means that this wreckage can continue to be contested, but it does leave a little bit of an opening here. You can imagine a whole bunch of medium tanks jumping on top of this composition would definitely cause a huge, huge problem. Stuck Fart does go down to the Janus right here. Retaliatory strike. Now, if the forces from the pink commander weren't doing so phenomenally right now, I'd say this is a little bit of a bad move, sending all these units across when really we should have just, just pushed slowly and claimed all this metal right here. We do have a constructor, by the way, idle, that could definitely eat up a lot of those wreckages. The enemy commander and the friendly one alike. But yeah, this joint push has actually worked out quite nicely. We also have the lashers in the mix as well to shoot down any of those shurikens. Big push on the southern side as well. The red team is absolutely cascading right now. You can see this one push broke through on this line, weakened the blue line, so now they're back like this, and now Clev is going to fall. The green line on the southern side has also been weakened, and suddenly the blue team doesn't have a leg to stand on. We're doing mass pawn spam right now. Uh, we'll see how that works. Those uh, riot tanks especially good against the pawns. And there it goes. Hero riot tank right there. The green player is holding on for dear life right now. I'm assuming, yeah, we're all the way up to Tech 2 in the back line up here on the northern side. Obviously way behind the Tech 2 up on the northern side. We already have a fusion reactor. We already have had these T2 metal extractors for a good long while. You can see that metal advantage is tremendous for the blue team, but the red team has a crazy positional advantage. If we can lock down these metal extractors, if we can reclaim a lot off this front line, if we can manage to do all this, but ifs and buts will only get you so far. Geothermal extremely low. Does go down. Okay, that's instrumental here. That geothermal was a large part of the power production. It was feeding this T2 laboratory for the Terminator, so it going down definitely means a lot right now. Shurikens do jump on top of only those two whistlers that were in the mix here, and eventually this will all be deflected. Was that an efficient trade? Well, we lost the commander. This one was reclaimed by the orange team. This one is yet to be reclaimed, but it will be reclaimed here by the blue team. I would say it's about an even trade. Save for the fact that we did a bunch of economic damage. Definitely well worth it. Lavender Commander did pay for that uh, T2 lab with that trade, though, so... Ah, uh, yeah, once those T2... Oh, no, sorry. They have a T2 constructor, but they haven't gone T2 yet. Uh, actually, not a bad idea. You go for a whole bunch of those T1 while your opponent's still on T1. Essentially, you're going to have four times as many T1 forces. And the numbers do not lie. T2 is out on the battlefield. Purple Commander are going to start producing some of those T2 forces. This is the benefit of pushing your lane, of course, is that you get that T2 extremely early. Love the T2 upgrades right here. How's the Maroon Commander doing? We are on T2 as well. A little bit slower behind on the economic growth, though. Going to be a little bit tricky to get back into that game once those T2s start pushing, but as soon as those vehicles start expressing their advantage re or relative to the T2 bots, I think this will eventually all be well. Huge D-guns right there by Achilles MSG, by the way. Those Shuriken enabling that commander to sneak right up and obliterate the army for the pink commander, Anolis, who is now put on the back foot here. Has to deal with some barrage of artillery coming in from the northern side. I think that was an excellent recovery right there. Uh, Resbots put together the geothermal once more as well. That's quite nice. Definitely increasing the energy production available to the green commander. Oh, thought we were going to forget about this for a second. Definitely don't want to leave one of those T2 mechs unupgraded. Remember, those four times, four X your, your income, right? You get four times the metal from one of those that you do from a normal one. Obscenely well worth it.
This is always an awkward dance. Rocketbots, technically outranging the uh, riot tanks here. However, their actual line of sight is not that huge. You can see they just barely outrange the riot tanks, but it is so, so close. Every time those riot tanks fire, ugh, yeah, it hurts quite a lot. Radar is desperately needed up here from Spojev. Didn't detect those shuriken coming in, didn't detect hardly anything. Yep, Yellow Commander needs to plop a radar tower down up there, otherwise this is going to be a mess. Oh, hounds get degunned up north here. I saw this commander moving in against those hounds. That is not good. Yeah, the Maroon Commander just... Well, it's great for the Maroon Commander, Ravenheart, who just got a massive degun against those hounds. Absolutely shuts down that snowball quite significantly. We're down to three hounds once more here for the Purple Commander. And on the retreat, medium tanks pushing forward here. Now there's a commander. Oh, you gotta be careful. You gotta be so careful. Yeah. Whole bunch of those medium tanks do get blasted apart here by the degun as well as the reinforcing hounds. I don't mind the hound spam. I would like to see some welders included though. Very easy to just throw a couple of welders into the comp, but it adds so much sturdiness to your composition. Really hard to overestimate or over overstate rather how powerful just a couple of those welders can be. You don't need to mass them. You really don't. You only need about, say, four or five of them. Which is definitely expensive if you're trying to fund it off of the T1, but we should be well upgraded to T2 economies by now. It's always interesting to think about the evolution of T2 teching. It definitely feels like it's become extremely efficient nowadays. There once was a time where commanders gave you, gosh, what was it, 2,500 metal? Something like that, when, when the commander went down? Absolutely nuts. <laughs> we think about, think about that nowadays, and you think, yeah, you could probably eco up to a T2 laboratory off of your commander's death by probably minute five with that much metal. How did we ever, how did we ever get to where we are now from such a crazy change like that? Anywho, medium tanks continuing to ravage this midline. Yeah, we're not really going up the tech chain here. The Orange Commander more than happy to just continue pumping out T1. A call for Shuriken goes out. I think it's a great call. Are there any in the air? No, it does not look like it. No Shuriken available right here. There are shuriken for the tank commander, though, and it's going to mean that Spojov can degun down a whole bunch of those poor, unfortunate hounds. There we go. Shuriken eventually pull over towards these medium tanks. I think plus the shuriken, this will eventually be dealt with. Ah, fighters pull, though. Enabling those medium tanks to roll forward once more. Yeah, they get into the back line. If we can popple that juicy, juicy economy back here, I think this is going to be quite well worth it. The hero medium tank eradicates those energy converters, effectively shutting off a huge portion of that economy, leaving the lavender player with, well... Frankly, quite a lot of metal production still. I mean, these are T2 metal extractors, 12 apiece, so 24 in total. Plus, the fusion reactor means production is still going to be massive. Oh, that's an unfortunate wreckage. Hope we clear that out. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> that, that would be unfortunate if your lab got completely stalled by that sort of a thing. We are up to a T2 economy, by the way, for the orange commander, though. So at the very least, things are looking somewhat even. Here come the Quakers, though. We've all seen just how brutal those Quakers can be. Mauser, their counterpart, tearing apart this northern section. Yeah, this is that vehicles versus bots advantage I was talking about. Ah, losing that pulsar sucks. That's a lot of metal right down the drain. Commander is definitely not safe to approach a uh, oncoming barrage of artillery fire. Mauser have a little bit of AOE to them, as well as the Quaker. Well, actually, a lot of AOE to them. Is that commanders definitely especially prone to uh, being blasted apart regardless of their cloaking abilities. Not to mention you're also shorting yourself of a thousand energy per second that you're walking around here. Yeah. Purple commander without the energy in order to actually keep all this up and running. Uh, down he goes. Beautiful snipe right there with a whole bunch of these Mauser. They are pushing dangerously far forward here. Oh, I really don't want to see these push too far forward. They don't really have any support in front of them. They need a couple of Jaguars, those T2 Armada Lightning Tanks, standing in front to deal with any sort of, well, units that they actually encounter. Yeah, Mauser are forced to fall back here, and I think that's the right idea. Meanwhile, Heavy Tanks have completely broken through the line here for Anolis, who is learning quite rapidly the lesson 
as to how efficient those T2 vehicles are up against the T1. The medium tanks even cowering before the might of the Quaker, lobbing those very heavy projectiles nowadays out across the field. I've talked about it already in previous casts, but I just want to mention once more that the Quaker was updated so as to differentiate it a little bit from the, uh, the Mauser, its Armada counterpart, giving it a much stronger projectile. I think it's a great change. Definitely much more Cortex. Commander does go down. Shuriken were there to try and paralyze as much of this as possible, but the commander falls regardless, and that's going to mean that these heavy tanks have essentially nothing stopping them from pushing forward and ravaging the base. Go. Onward. And ever upward. The Greed Force is continuing to push forward. There they go. Quaker's finally launching an all-out assault on that laboratory. I don't think it'll stand all too much longer. Well, I guess as long as that build power is there to repair it. But even so... The build turrets go down, and just like that, the Powder Pink player is eliminated from the game. Red Commander just withstood a massive barrage over here. T2 support vehicles coming out at this point. Quakers as well, going to be marching down, or well, maybe rolling down on the southern side. Pink player leaves the match. Orange Commander going to be inheriting all of their woes and all of their worries. Melting Tools base completely ravaged as well. These heavy tanks, man, they are brutal. One of those benefits for the heavy tanks of the Cortex faction is that they fire quite a bit more rapidly. It means they don't tend to overkill nearly as much. They do a lot of damage, but they fire multiple projectiles in rapid succession, rather. It means that they can, uh, yeah, they can blast down especially economy with extreme efficiency. Wind turbines come to mind as well as just one of those things that they're very, very good against in general. Quakers continuing to fire away in the back lines over here as well. They popped a bunch of energy converters as well as a lot of the build power, but eventually these heavy tanks will clean them up. It's just a matter of when. There we go. Finally, last Quaker is blasted to smithereens here, and the forces will be repelled. But just in time, the eco player on the northern side, who has been teching up all this way, has gone for a single Aphis Marauder Rush. Already has five of these bad boys out and across the map just as the T2 lab finishes up on the front line here from Multi-Tool. The German commander going to be learning a harsh lesson in the Armada reality. The Marauder is king. Running across the map here and doing a tremendous amount of damage. There was so much metal down the drain because that lab went down just before it was finished. It means the entire weight of metal that was, well, in that uh, building right there does crumble to the ground and vanish. I've always wondered about that, if maybe they should add like a wreckage feature where it just turns into sort of a scrap pile like this, kind of just completely un unintelligible, unfinished, to buildings that are in progress that die. It would definitely change things a little bit. Heavy tanks jumping on top of this friendly Mauser, causing a lot more friendly fire than I think anything else. <laughs> Basically directly firing at their teammates. Not gonna matter though, the heavy plating on those tanks is absolutely well worth it. Capable of sustaining extreme punishment. Tick spam here is quite nice. Quaker gonna be quite good for pushing forward here. Commander falls for the yellow commander. Commander of the yellow commander falls. Is the commander the soul or the body? I think a Cortex and Armada commander would answer that differently. This Marauder is still quite valuable though. Here they are, pushing into the back lines. Marauder never going to win an award for the most DPS of any unit. They're never going to win an award for most imminently threatening to heavy tanks and mammoths and sumos and all that sort of thing. But they all but make up for it in the fact that they are so maneuverable that they can get into virtually any spot, any space, and cause absolute havoc. They do just enough damage to be menacing to economies, laboratories, build power, all those squishier targets with enough speed to actually get there. Essentially bypassing defenses, storming the beaches. Yeah, definitely by and by one of the most powerful units in the game overall. To many a commander's disdain, I'm sure. <laughs> We've all been the target of this Marauder rush. Nuke Silo, or anti-nuke Silo, pardon me, does go down right here. Opens up the opportunity to a nuclear strike here. I wonder if anybody's planning on that. I don't think so, but always, uh, always, uh, yeah, important to open up those opportunities whenever you can. Ah, and just to top it all off, the anti-air missile firing away here. Looks like the red team, fed up with those marauders in their back line, as well as the lime green heavy tanks pushing through as well, decides to call it, throw in the towel, and calls GG. Definitely an excellent game right here. The blue team showing an excellent amount of coordination, and at the end of the day, the T2 investment does win out in the end.
Thanks a ton for watching, and I sure hope you enjoy these daily Beyond Our Reason casts. I do post one of these a day, so if you're interested in all things Beyond Our Reason, I definitely recommend you stick around. Down in the description section, you'll find a link to my Beyond Our Reason Discord channel. There's a whole bunch of lovely folks in there. That's also where I announce the live streams on Tuesdays and Saturdays, 12 PDT, in case you're interested in joining up on those. Other than that, though, I just hope, uh, just hope rather, that you have a great rest of your day, and I will see you in the very next game of Beyond All Reason. Peace out, everybody.